welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to the transmitter demonstration. Our RP director, John Howe, is going to be demonstrating how we track eagles with the transmitters that Brett Maddernack and the team at Eagle Valley have placed to help us study the Decora eagles. So here he comes, John Howe. Thank you, Ray. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, and and uh, good to see all the folks that might get to see this online for our virtual presentation. Um, we're going to talk about the tracking of the eagles that we do. It's been being done since D1, and that would have been back in the, I can hopefully refer to Amy for that. When did that start? About 20? That started 2011. 2011. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. So, and that program really came out of the question is, where are these decor eagles going? And everybody wanted to know that. And Brett Mandernack with the Eagle Valley uh, Kohler uh, Nature Preserve over in Wisconsin, just a little bit south of Prairie Machine, has been doing eagle research for decades. And so uh, Bob, knowing Brett very well from way back in the University of Minnesota uh, Raptor Center days and, and other uh, work with falcons, basically teamed up to uh, track, trap, and transmit a transmitter like this on the back of the eagles and then track and do a study of where the decor eagles go and what happens to them. Um, definitely something that has been controversial. Many people are of the mindset of why would you do something like that to this beautiful animal? Um, and it's something that we know from studies that it isn't something that impedes their life or could cause an end to their life. But I tell you what, one of the couple of things that we've learned very important. I mean, what we've learned is that probably the highest mortality rates for the core eagles are electrocution on top of poles, and that is that has basically uh, uh, resulted in, at least in this area, and the problem becoming more well known that the tops of the poles need to be made in a fashion that they won't electrocute eagles and other raptors. Um, we found out that there's a significant number of eagles that are hit from the ones that we've tracked, our own statistics and what we know uh, from recovery and rehab center statistics that eagles get hit when they're eating roadkill. They eat live food and they also eat carrion. So uh, it's gotta be something safe, but it's something that people like me once in a while when I see something and I see eagles or vultures, I'll move that safely uh, on, on to the side of the road if I can. Definitely not something to cause a road accident or anything. But you have to be careful when you do those things. The other thing is our most recent uh, eaglet uh, and the one that this transmitter came from was uh, from being uh, uh, killed basically by eating and ingesting lead shot. So this is the transmitter that we put on D35 along with D36, who's now just in southern Minnesota. Uh, D35 uh, uh, was uh, uh, died earlier this year. We tracked that. We saw that the signal had stopped. Brett checked that. It's like, OK, it looks like we have something going on. They tracked it. They found it in the snow. Uh, and when it came, that sore, because a lot of the lead analysis work uh, for the state of Iowa, where lead uh, poison birds Transmitters are put around the wings 
down through the wing tip, back up to the back. And these are very flexible. People have asked, can that get in the way of them, you know, copulating or having young and things like that. The studies have shown that these things do not deter that process. So uh, D27, who we know is right in the Iowa area and like what, four or five years old, got a white head. And so, uh, you know, she's going to be uh, breeding age here real soon. The only unfortunate thing is that these tracking uh, uh, the, the GPS tracker here and the VHF uh, radio transmitter here. This one lasts for about two, maybe three years maximum. This one I think is up to like maybe three to five plus years, uh, depending. It's got little solar panels built in here. Um, I can show you guys this. There's the antennas. Here's some of the straps that were cut. They're Teflon straps. D27 is past the time point where this works, but we're still getting data from the satellite transmitter. And we know that she's over uh, east on Pole Line Road, or west on Pole Line Road, just over on the upper Iowa River, over towards Lumpkin. It is. It's a function of battery life. Um, otherwise, these things would just, if there's a power solution to this thing, we could do it pretty much indefinitely. So, for the folks here that might not be able to see that close, here's a nice uh, shot of this. Uh, um, there's actually a little magnet that goes on this unit that can stop it from depleting the battery. And same thing, there's a magnet on here stopping this from sending data up to the, the satellite. Okay. So there's our transmitter. What we have to do the tracking, there's a couple different uh, antennas. This is a VHF antenna. There's also uh, an antenna that will track directly with the, the satellite. Um, so if you know when the satellite data is coming through, which is like every, goes every six hours on, six hours off, if I remember right from talking to Brett. If you know that frequency, then uh, you're able to go out and actually use a smaller little antenna to locate where the eagles are, about the same distance, about uh, up to five, six miles. So I'm going to show you how we do this process. And this is going to work good here today. Um, I'm not going to be able to get some audibles today because unfortunately the NICAD batteries in this um, would not charge. And it looks like they are either expired and will have to be replaced. Uh, which I can do, but obviously I don't have replacement batteries. So Amy's going to serve as our transmitter. She knows how this works. She volunteered right there. I didn't even have to ask her. She's so good. All right. So this is what this is our antenna. Just you know, same same uh, technology as your TV antennas. This is the, yep, this is the Yagi, we, it's a brand name Yagi or style Yagi antenna. This one has five poles on it, some of them have three. This one has a range of up to like three to five miles, uh, depending on, you know, hills and valleys and what's in the way. I've, uh, the last time I used this successfully was D35 up uh, just south of the Twin Cities. She was hanging out just on the Minnesota River. That was, uh, because there was like, tons of animals in, in October, November, and December right by the Burnsville, Minnesota landfill. So there's obviously there's varmints and other things and food pieces and things at those landfills that attract uh, birds at certain times of the year. So that's the last time I got to use this was when we tracked D35 up there. Um, and she was down in Iowa when she uh, when she ate the, the lead and, and died. So so this is hooked into the unit here. And it went, basically, the, the system works as uh, if I was pointing straight at this transmitter and it was up, you know, straight up on the bluff ahead of me, if I'm directly aligned with it, we're going to get the strongest volume signal. So what would that sound like, Amy? Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> or would be more like ding, ding. It's yeah. a beep. Ding, beep. Oh. <laughs> it's more like a beep than a ping. Yep, you got it. So as I move to the side, that will get lower. And then it will 
listening to somebody about DDT and the effects on raptors, and DDT did not have the same effect on golden eagles as it did with bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and other birds that eat fish primarily because the, fit, the DDT would bioaccumulate in the, fit, in the fish fatty tissues. Um, mammals don't have that kind of same pairing of reserves and concentrations and bioaccumulation of DDT and its metabolites as, as fish species do. So golden eagles pretty much were spared from the egg thinning, shell thickening, and the crushing of the eggs, which really caused almost the, the extinction or extirpation of the bald eagle and peregrine falcon in North America here. Out in the western states and up in Canada were areas where that, that wasn't happening as much because it just wasn't applied near as, as heavily as it was down here in the, in the uh, U.S. Uh, states area. So, um, but that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to continue tracking D36. He is just currently north uh, of the Iowa-Minnesota border and on the uh, Rook River by Chatfield, kind of hanging out there between there and Preston, Minnesota. Um, right now, you know, if I had time um, on the way back home or whatever, uh, the next week or so, I go back and forth to Decora, probably pull this out, get his frequency dialed in, and see if we can locate him and see where he is. He's been hanging out on the river there for, it's, it's been over a month, I'm pretty sure. So, so any questions you guys have? Uh, yeah, well, while the Grace Chatfield to get to across from the boat ride, can you bring that along? Yeah. Chat, uh, actually, I go through Spring Grove, Spring Grove, Caledonia, up to La Crosse is the shortest oh, okay. route. Could go all the way towards Rochester to I-90 and do that. Um, I'm going to be heading that way late Saturday night. So uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing that at the night time. Amy, if she or somebody else who, well, actually, I can't do that because the battery is not working. I'd have to get uh, another unit from Brett. Uh, Brett's about two hours uh, uh, away from here. So, good question. Um, I'm going to have to wait until I get this battery thing. I, I was calling your name as I was coming south on Wednesday and she just didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, Robin. When you say D20 sheds and sends a postcard, is that something that you have to go looking for to see? You have to go to a program to look so for? So Brett gets the raw yeah. Brett gets the raw data, and then he shares that with us. And Amy takes that, and she works it up. Brett, Brett, and uh, Ryan and the crew there. Um, Brett and Ryan primarily put those nice colored maps with the uh, satellite uh, 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 images on. It. And then we can further refine it. I'll show you a cool map that Amy put together, which really was kind of helping us see and think and look like an eagle. And that is, if you are in Chatfield and you're high enough where eagles typically fly with the curvature of the earth, you can actually see the Cora and see the whole river system and everything. So people wonder why eagles, you know, can track and, and other raptors can track the landscape so well. Um, they're not limited just this you know, what we see with everything blocking things, when they're up in the air and they're where they typically migrate, they can see probably 50 plus miles ahead. It's probably more than that, uh, whatever well, what, that limitation of What the altitude do they normally? Uh... They can go up to 10,000 feet, and I think I used a look at the horizon, and I can't factor in their excellent eyesight, but I think I figured that maybe as high up as they are, the horizon would be around 100. 130 to 140 miles at one point. So we, I looked at 10,000 feet through Google Earth and you could see Decora. And you guys, I'm just gonna break in really quickly here. If you go to our website at www.raptorresource.org, roll over, explore, you'll see a Eagle Maps option and our interactive maps will allow you to play around. There's a bit of a learning curve on it, but not too bad. And you can see the travels of any of the Eagles we've tracked, so. It's so much fun. Yeah, it's really neat. One question? I think these have changed that much. I'm pretty sure that these these units that are on that we've used up until last year are the same 
there's been a few improvements over ten years but they're basically about the same size they use the same technology the same antennas right now we're moving towards a little bit smaller unit and it also uses cellular data too um, and it will once it gets in it'll collect data uh, but once it gets close enough to cellular signal it will start start dumping the data um, how much does the little bit uh, it's not much. I, I guess I haven't. The North American Banding Council very, recommends that any kind of tracking or banding uh, technology be less than five percent of its weight on any given bird. I don't remember the weight either, but this is, I like, believe, one percent or less of the weight. Very on it's, it's way under. Very well. Good questions. Any others? After five years, you know, you said the battery flat. It will not. Um, people talked about the possibility of having, uh, you know, straps and things that could be designed to fall off, or that you could just press a button and it would release and things like that. And it's just, I mean, we know that the reliable, right, reliability, the best technology that we have right now is that we can communicate with these things if they're successful all the time for about maybe up to uh, three, three to five years. So you'd have to do it in that time period, it'd have to work all the time, otherwise, uh, I guess if it malfunctioned and it came off, you know, prematurely or something, that's the other thing is, yeah. you know, if it came off and only half of it was attached, then that would really be a big that problem. So bad, yeah. the, the, the prevailing uh, reasoning is put it on, put it on permanently so it can't come off accidentally, <laughs> partially, and cause damage to the bird. We already know that, I mean, we look at this and we think that, you know, oh my gosh, the eagle's like, they're not looking in the mirror saying, boy, I wish this thing wasn't on my back. They just, they're not, they don't think like humans. Um, and they just, they grew up with it. They've had it on their whole life. They even preen the antennas just like their feathers. Um, you know, you look on this one, there's a couple little hack marks from the beak there. Um, you know, so they, they uh, it just, it, what, from what we observe and what we see, it looks like it just becomes part of their, their body. It is, what is the estimated population of bald eagles in Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota? Uh, boy, I know we're, um, that's something that I don't have committed to memory. Wisconsin and Iowa that. stopped counting, mm -hmm. so they, the DNRs of both states used to do counts, and eventually there were so many eagles, they're just like, yeah. we're doing pretty well here, so mm -hmm. we are going to put our limited resources towards the species that haven't recovered. So. A lot of times, not always, but a lot of times states will pay close attention to an endangered or threatened species. Once they start the delisting process and it's delisted in the state, then they'll tend, they'll drop off the radar and they'll turn their attention to something else. And peregrine falcons, are they still a species peregrine of falcons, concern in Wisconsin? Are, yeah, they're still uh, endangered and threatened in Wisconsin. And that has to do actually with a deal that Bob Anderson and Greg Sefton, I believe, brokered with the Wisconsin DNR that until they had a sizable cliff, con uh, cliff population that they wouldn't consider delisting them because they weren't necessarily truly independent unless you had a large population spread across a wide variety of habitats. Right. So. And that's one of the neat things uh, that, that we get to do. We've got a, a volunteer crew of folks that uh, early in the year they help uh, through boats and through spotting scopes and Amy and I do it too along with Dave Kester, Sophia, and, and others, uh, uh, Bill Smith. Uh, they, our team goes up and down the river and looks at the historic sites that we know, because they're probably gonna come back to the same site if there's nothing that gets in the way of that. Uh, but we're looking for new sites. There's, we're finding that they're nesting in a lot of places. We've got you know, four or five nests, or four nests at least, in the Winona area and Fountain City area that are within a fairly small you know radius and we I guess we're getting a good idea of how close they can tolerate other falcons near them but the neat thing about that is we're part of that monitoring process that obviously is going to help the state make those decisions yes so the peregrine falcon monitoring and banding work that we do. John, I think I heard you mention that the GPS data you get has an accuracy of five or six kilometers is that right? I didn't mention that. Um, no, the GPS data is tight. 
it, it's, oh, I can't tell you exactly how tight it is. It's probably it's, meters. Yeah, all right, that's what I thought. It's meters. Um, probably like 10 meters. And maybe even less than that. Yeah. Good, I was worried. How are the eagles seedless on traps? So what we do is we habituate them to come down to mulch piles that work good in the decor area. And I think that idea came up because it was either being used or they like to sit on mulch piles over by the, the uh, refuse. Uh, 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 mulch piles that are just on the other side here way way back when um, but we'll use the the pan, pan am uh, trap looks like a metal hoop um, and uh, it's got little uh, little loops of netting it's got netting and then it's got little loops of filament coming up that they walk in there and then their feet get caught in that and then as they try to move the nooses get tighter and that will just mobilize them um, so we'll We'll put a hula hoop out there, or we did, put a hula hoop out there with fish. They get used to going in there, they eat the fish, and then one day we replaced the hula hoop with an actual trap, and we're all prepared and everybody's ready to go. It's usually very early in the morning, and uh, it's been a very successful process from what I've seen. And when Brett yells go, we don't say how fast we go, as fast as we can. I mean, you've got to understand, from the point that Brett determines that eagle is caught, the point we're there and the, the Pan Am trap is held with basically with more or less not really a bungee but something springy it so it can't fly off with it or hit the end and get shot but we're also there I don't know second two yeah. seconds <laughs> it's, 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 it's under 10, 10 seconds so, so uh, oh we're not far away we're hidden but we're not too far away it, 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 just like falconers you know have done through the ages once the the hood is put over their eyes you know they breathe and they just they breathe fine it doesn't hurt them, and they just calm down. It's just like it's just like nothing is going on. Um, so they get measured, weighed, uh, the the transmitter is put on, and then they're checked uh, for anything that, that they might notice as an issue, and then released. So. So you do that right at the site where they're Yeah, or yeah. We We've typically done it here in the garage over at the whole house. So, so you transport the eagle. Uh, we just walk it over here, you know, a couple hundred feet. The video is still on. There is good down here, I think, right? If you trap them at the you trap them at the landfill or we trap them right here. Oh right here. Yeah. Right here. Oh right. you put the most piles are here. Yeah, we put oh, the most pile over here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Is it lack of funding that is causing you to not do this more often or you just don't want to be overloaded with data? Um We've done as much as we have opportunity to and as much as we feel like we can manage with the staff that we've got. And, um, you know, we can coordinate with somebody like Brett Mandernack, who's, you know, a, a researcher that has been doing this his whole professional career. And, you know, it really has to do with what he has capacity to do. And Jeff, I saw Jeff was there. Um, Jeff is uh, our me and Jeff are the official RRP employees, right? <laughs> Jeff just came on, he's half time, and uh, um, basically uh, uh, Jeff and Brett are the ones who are gonna be working on the Golden Eagle study. If Jeff was not here and Jeff was not interested and Jeff didn't, you know, was had the interest and the excitement to do this, we wouldn't be doing it. So it really is, what would we want to do? What would be neat to know? What are some things that we could do? It has to do with the interest of our resources, and it also has to do with you know what we can do. Um, there's other folks out on the West Coast I know doing eagle tra tracking studies still, um, and things like that. So uh, uh, it's not probably done as much because the, uh, we're getting a lot of data, and and uh, um, people know a lot more about eagles and raptors and what's happening. But I tell you what, with the climate change that's happening right now. We are seeing shifts in cycles of nesting and migration and, and with the kestrel, you know, depletion of, of numbers that nobody fully understands right now. So these monitoring and tracking studies, um, I don't think there's, there's any less need for them. They're probably going to get even more necessary to help us try to understand how we're affecting these populations and then try to recover and do something to alleviate that. Any questions on a global eagle? Study? Yeah, any questions? I think we, I was telling them just as some, <coughs> a little bit of interest points for that, but 
Does anybody have any questions how we would be doing this with the Golden Eagles? Or? Are they that populous in this area? Yeah. And Jeff, if you want to come over here, we are we have an audience, a virtual audience that can see oh, us okay. right here. All right. So we do have, we're very fortunate we have a wintering population of Golden Eagles here in the Driftless. They come down, they're generally known as the eastern population. There's an eastern and western population. As you know, Golden Eagles are circumpolar and they're found around the globe at these latitudes. Um, but they're certainly divided between kind of Rocky Mountain, California, Alaska, and this eastern Canadian population, which is considerably different in their behaviors and what they do. So these birds uh, summer, if you will, in the, in the Arctic, above Nunavik, above Hudson's Bay, above Churchill, where all the stories of the polar bears are, right? Or they live north of that yet. And they come down, oh, to New York State, the Appalachians, areas very much like the Driftless, and they also come here in the Driftless during the winter months. They arrive in December and stay through the end of February, beginning of March. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is understand their migration, their nesting, what they're doing, where they're going, what they're eating. It's not something that is known. Five years ago, as a younger fella, and a falconer being out here, Fox squirrels, gray squirrels, rabbits, 
absolutely. They take geese, they take ducks, they take, they, we have a guy call me one morning and he checked your email, he's jumping out of his socks, no, why? I'm a bow hunter and my trail cam got the most incredible footage you're going to, you're not going to believe it. I'm talking to him, I bring it up. There's about 50 photos. Group of deer going down the trail early in the morning, right at daybreak. Here comes an immature, now, immature golden. Took down an 80 pound deer on the deer trail. Oh my gosh. One tail on the base of the spine, one on the head. Good night, nurse. Now, here was the incredible thing. So I went up, you know, that day later, let that bird be, leave it alone, give it some privacy, right? Get up there towards sunset, saw this bird take, took an obviously very large crop. I wonder if he'll come back. Never came back. Really? Next morning, you know, it's, it's January, that, that deer is hard as ice, right? So the coyotes and the, the chickadees and everything else, and blue jays and whatnot, all set up on the song pretty quick. Never came back. Um, they do the same with turkeys, both on the ground and in the air. So we're talking to these guys. So as an example, turkeys roost in trees, if you didn't know that. They get up in the trees at night, sunset. The great thing about being a golden eagle researcher following them hunting turkeys, turkeys don't come out of the trees till like nine. You know, they're not like crack of dawn. <laughs> you have to sleep in a little bit, you know. But you can see them up on the ridge. They're like three quarters of the way up in trees, you know. And they'll start coming out. They're going to go to their field that they're feeding on, usually where there was a, they know exactly where there was a grain transfer and there's big dumps and beans and corn. Ah, you know, they're going right there. And doop, they're going across. Here comes two, three. Here comes a lone jay. Mid-sized, 12-pound bird. There's a brown dot, 1,200 feet up. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And kaboom, hits them in the air. I've also seen them go in where there's large flocks and just go into the flock and drill one. Wow. Like, you know. Everybody else runs for cover, I can tell you that. Um, amazing hunters. They can crash through the brush just like a goshawk when they're going after a fox squirrel. They're good at fox squirrels and they seem to like them. Not sure why that is, but they do. And uh, as another just amazing thing found from the cellular data, the pair in Kentucky, it's a mated pair, which is what we're going for, um, was really trying to get made in pairs as much as we can. So we don't under really know much about what they're doing. Certainly up north at the nest site. No one's watched them, we have no idea. Um, so these birds will copulate the day they're leaving, maybe the day before, and they split. She goes all the way to New York State, the eastern edge around the Great Lakes. She's going up above Hudson's Bay. He goes west up to the Driftless hangs here for a week or two, then he goes up the western side of the Great Lakes, and get this, <laughs> the last two years they arrived at the nest site at the same day. <laughs> and they were calculating within hours of each other. Because they arrived, they could they got all the data points, and then they could see them right on top of each other. And then they're apart, because they're getting live feeds like every couple seconds to get the data. What do you think they're eating up there, I asked them. Waterfall, no doubt about it fly out over water, 1,200 feet because the data gives us elevation. This is insane information. And then we see a straight scoop right on the edge of the water where there's swamp. So we know it's waterfowl. Geese, swans, they got it all up there, right? They got everything. We're not sure exactly, but we know most likely waterfowl. So the next big hurdle is for us to get pairs. What's their fidelity to this area? Anecdotally, we see the same, what we believe are the same pairs in the exact same valley every year. Are they, is their fidelity to the driftless? Is their fidelity to the north end, the south end? Are the, is it common for them to go completely different routes? Did the young hang with them the first year at all? Um, what determines whether they're East Coast birds, Appalachians, or Driftless birds. There's so much yet for us to learn. We're going to get a handle on that. And the next huge hurdle is 
to send John up to polar bear country. With with cameras, because uh, that is never ever <coughs> filmed. Nothing like that has ever been filmed. So uh, our key and thanks to people like you that donate and are involved and help get the word out. Our view is able to fund this research and uh, situation may be and you're in a blind some distance away with the controls. Mm -hmm. You do that with golden eagles, you'll never catch one. We would watch them hunt. They root they never hunt in the valleys they roost in. I love that about them. They always hunt valleys over and they are looking for coolies that are have big groups of, of turkeys in them. And they love cruising the bluff line because of the ridge line, they'll get a nice updraft and they can just cruise it, cross the valley, cruise the other side of the, you know, the ridge line, you know, and they're up 800 feet above the ridge line. Um, so we'll put a, a look-alike to our wild turkeys, they're called Spanish blacks, we use them. But we quickly discovered if we are in the valley in a blind, they will not come in that valley. Now, you tell me, we're in that blind at 3 a.m. They don't start, they don't start until 3, they start to which is like 9, 10 o'clock. Especially when there's a little, you know, um, piece been generated that gives them some up trapped on the rich line. So they have no idea we're there, right? They know we're there. <laughs> so, it's got to be understood, are they seeing our heat signal? Dark and they're seeing the heat waves coming off of our of the blind, and they they're that flippin' smart. They are shy. Um, when you can, when you get one, I've had the opportunity to actually handle several of them. Wild birds. They are incredibly mellow and docile, which blows my mind. The most intense predator, aerial predator on the planet, is a sweetie. <laughs> and one that we trapped, we got it late in the day, kind of funny story, the guy who had the, the transmitter, I called him, I'm like, Mark, we've got a bird, get down here right away. Like, I'm going in for hernia surgery in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to trans get the transmitter and then hold the bird and I did it the next day and we flipped that bird, we flipped that bird but that's our glass. How do you tell a golden from an English Okay, a couple real key features. My favorite to tell people that are looking at birds. Um, because they are easily confused with immature fall, there's two things to focus on. Armpit under the wing. If there's any white at all, it's an immature ball. They are black as night in their even juvenile, adult, all the same, but in, I don't know, and John can, and Amy can help, how many immature balls have you seen that don't have some white in here? They, they're, they've got it. The other thing is when you're looking up, number one is the snaz. This is an old crowd, you'll get this. They got, bald eagles have a Jimmy Durante snaz, don't they? Yeah. They got a big dang beak on them. Baldies don't. They've got a nice little hawk beak on them. And you can look up and see that can opener or a very refined beak and bam, you know. Sometimes the light won't let you really see the underside. You know, juveniles have a white patch on there. They're, they're booty feathers, you know, back there. And some white on their underside. No, down far, but not all the way down. And where in Wisconsin is the best place to try to hopefully like see Yeah. So generally the way it looks is like a mile to two towards the river. The river about a mile or two out. That's kind of bald eagle country. Yeah. I mean they go out in the, in the county, right? Because they're looking for dead deer in the winter. But generally that's their 
Goldings are generally outside that zone. Anywhere there's blood country. And the best way to find Goldens, ask turkey hunters. <laughs> Where, you know, when turkey season's over, you, can, you know, they're usually totally into it as well. And they'll many times have, no, I've seen them, right? Because they're out maybe early, early, early spring. And you'll have a few straggler immatures that are wait until the end of middle of March before they split. But wherever there's turkeys, follow the food. Do they nest similarly to bald eagles? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. But yeah, up in Canada, this eastern population are tree nesters. In the west, they're also nesters. Right. I, I got. I'll tell you real quickly the coolest golden eagle story ever. We got about five minutes. Then this will take. Four and a half. No, this is fast. <laughs> uh, I did two stents of veterinary work with birds of prey out in, in Meridian, Idaho, which is the outside of Boise, right on the edge of the southern Idaho desert. It had been a big fire, so a lot of prey was gone, and we were getting a lot of intergraphics coming in. And this rancher, this Idaho desert rancher, I mean, this guy is, you know, his face looks like a catcher's mitt. <laughs> Unreal dude comes in and he's, he's cradling the golden eagle like the baby. And he knows Dr. Lee, Doc, Doc, this bird, you know, it's been in bad shape. It's got going after my chickens and got all tangled up in the chicken wire. She hurt, Doc, she hurt. She's bad. He was just beside himself. This guy's 70 years old, right? He's built like a tank, too. How all wrapped. Well, it's only like 110 to sight him, for God's sakes, in August. Like, got to get this stuff off and I'm unwrapping it. Blood, blood, I'm thinking, oh, oh, this bird's in rough shape, man. And the guy's there, be careful, she's scared, no, don't, don't hurt her, you know. We won't hurt her, we know what we're doing. I get the last wrap off, it's not the eagle's blood. She's got all eight pounds embedded in this guy's forearm. I mean, in the bone. This man never wins, he never said a word. I'm like, Doc, Dr. Lee, and he's like, Jeff, go we'll get a rat. <laughs> I mean, how, she's got, she's starving, she's got fresh, bloody flesh in her arm, talent, she ain't letting go. So luckily we have some live rats, you know, and went and got one, and it's the brutal part, and I'm sorry. We had to make it squeal, get her excited, she let go of him, and grabbed it, got her off, scrub it down, and he says to the wife, you better get him to the hospital, he's going to do the stitches. Shoot, Doc, I got chores in the left. <laughs> we went there about a week later with the bird. We fed her up, fed her up, got her fat, went and flipped her. And he stood there on his farm field and bawled his eyes out. How flipping cool is that? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, uh, the next event we have.
so there's some great uh, exposure to letting people know, you know, what uh, rehabbers like Pay do, and so many other things like the work with the, the Eagles that uh, have lead poisoning in Iowa and focusing on that work. So, without me talking anymore, I will introduce Pay. Thank you for coming. Good, good. Thank you guys. So yeah, so help me remember because I forget this too. So you guys know now. So good. Um, yes, yeah, so my daughter, Savannah Judson, she has been helping um, SOAR. She is working on a master's degree in education, and so she's been doing a lot of our programming. Yay, because we've been really busy with birth. And Lynette is here. There she is. So yes, every because Lynette is the one who answers questions. She is the answer person. So, so I know some of you have been wanting to talk to her and see her, so green shirt, there you go. Um, and our special guest, but just a little background on SOAR. SOAR is a nonprofit. We do wildlife rehabilitation, education, and research. So the rehabilitation part, um, you guys know, we take in injured wild birds, we try to fix whatever's wrong with them, and release them back out into the wild. And so. That part did not stop during COVID. That part got way busier because everyone was told, oh, it's safe to go outside, go take a hike. And so um, I think we had more input, more incoming patients just because there were maybe more people were not sitting inside, you know, or going to ball games or the bar, maybe in our town they were still going to the bar. Um, that, you know, they were out and hiking and, and being outside, which is great, um, and getting exposed to more wildlife. I think we saw more um, incoming patients during 2020 than um, we have in a long time, and it doesn't seem to have let up, and we're starting to do programs again, so it's been really nice. I stay home and cut up fish, Vienna goes to programs, and Lynette takes care of everything that involves any kind of technology, so I don't... You know, after cutting up fish, I just cannot open a computer. I just, I can't do it. So, nice excuse. She handles other things. Yep, my fingers would be too dirty. I couldn't handle it. So I will try to send her videos and pictures and kind of update on what patients are coming and going. Um, and so today, we have I have a volunteer taking care of everyone back at SOAR, and she just texted me and said, I'm going to pick up another Hatchier Eagle. Um, and so we have had five of them come in so far this year. And so we're still, they're not from here, but but the babies are still still needing a little a little help, a little assistance with these things. So we're still, still working on, on all of that. Um, some of the birds that we cannot release back into the wild, um, we have permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service, permits from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources to do the rehabilitation and to keep some of our, our permanent education birds. And so I think we have maybe about 14 birds that are with us um, all the time to go to programs. And we brought one of them with us today. It's the screech owl. <laughs> then now big crate. <laughs> so no, we brought um, Decora. Uh, he came from the, the original fish hatchery nest here six years ago. Yes, he's six now. I think I lost a year somewhere. Yeah, he's seven already. That means I'm also seven years old. Yeah. Um, and so he maybe fledged a little early, was doing some low flying. The best we can guess is that he got hit by a car um, from, from the side. And um, a few days later was found in one of the creeks here on, on the hatchery property. And so um, Bobby Anderson, of course, waded in and grabbed him without gloves. And, um, <laughs> Uh, Cynthia Hansen transported to us, and he had he had a very high humerus fracture, an oblique fracture to this bone, and this side of the bone was on the wrong side. And so our surgeon um, in Spirit Lake, Dr. Dirks, uh, did a pin and, and got everything in place, 
but in the process of healing, the shoulder joint is impacted, and so he cannot, he can't do this. So he even can't quite do this, and so we're also suspecting that the nerve that runs up here along the shoulder and the, the um, collarbone area, that the, that nerve is somehow impacted too. So he's not a flyer, um, he cannot be released back into the wild, and he is on our education staff. He also had a very nice cut across his little eagle butt, and it had gotten maggots in it. And that's really what rehabilitators love, is picking maggots out of wounds. And so we now have a really nice medication that will fill them, which is much more fun than picking, but at that point we were just getting them out of him and letting that heal. But that did impact his tail and his tail feathers, so they were they're seeking blood, and so they were going down to the shaft of his tail feathers. He still has blood feathers yet in his tail. Um, so, he does not have a complete set of ten. When they're all there, he has seven. And right before, I think about a week ago, he most of all of them but three. So, <laughs> so he has three top and one is black. So I don't, I don't know, I know you guys are going to ask, but I have zero answers for what's going on with his tail. Um, so, is it, so, is it like my, my, my white stripe? Yeah, maybe it could have been with the age, but I don't know why he went, if he was white, and then he went back to black on that tail. So I, I don't know. Um, so I'm going to get him out. We'll sit him on the perch, um, and we'll give you some more, some more detail. on his nair either, so that's just going to have to stay there because he'll bite my finger. Um, yes! <laughs> um, and so the eye, uh, we just noticed this when we were kind of practicing for this program, that the eye on my side is looking just a little cloudy. Like he may have also had some sort of a partially detached retina in that accident. Um, and so we might have our vet just take a picture of that. Because he seems to be seeing <laughs> Um, and so he is an adult now. We do know, you know, he's 
at five, they're considered adults. So white, white head, yellow beak, mo mostly white tail. So D35 
135, came back, no broken bones, perfect looking um, skeleton, but we could see a lead metallic shot in his stomach because yes, we must prove that it is lead. So guess what we do? We cut him open and that's part of We have a permit from Fish and Wildlife Service to do the process on Eagle so we can continue this research. Um, find the lead shot, determine that it, yes, it is lead and not steel. Um, so that, that's what happened to D35. And so um, John and I were talking and, and the timing would have been, it would have been, could have been a pheasant. He's like, I'm just going to take off. Mm -hmm. He's like, this is a great day. Um, um, it could have been uh, scavenged a pheasant, maybe a squirrel, Turkey. some sort of small game animal, um, which is what you would be shooting with. There were number sixes or yeah. sevens. Could have been turkey too. Um, could have been turkey. Yep, yep. And so, so, um, yeah. So it's still out there. We're still seeing it. We're still seeing the poisoning about the same number that we did when it started to contract. Um, so, so more things to go on. One really encouraging thing. It just isn't consistent. One really encouraging thing is that in Iowa. Um, every county has a county conservation board. So they're like a miniature DNR. And in, in the state of Iowa, these nine, there's 99 counties, so the 99 county conservation board um, manage more hunting grounds than our state agency, than our Department of Natural Resources. So if we could get all 99 counties to require non-lead ammunition, on all of their hunting areas, huge. So we've gotten, their, their people have gone, and it's, they're run by a citizen board. So, so it's somebody's neighbor. Um, and so people are able to more informally discuss what's going on and talk about how things are going. Um, so one of the bigger counties that has, that has switched all over, like that's not the perch, exact perch that we use this is a little different perch, but yeah. same color. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so he's pretty much whatever he wants, is usually what we do. Um, but Story County, where Ames is, um, two years ago now, maybe three, they, they required non-lead ammunition on all of their hunting areas. So that would cover deer hunting, any kind of hunting, hunting non-lead. The first year, the, the rangers were not going to be really hardball about the like warnings, they were going to do some education, um, and then after that it might come up, but they have had no problems. No one has thrown a, a huge kit. Um, they seem to have some, some decent compliance and they're checking every so often. So, so it's just the, it's just the idea of getting people over this last little hump. Of, of going there and it's fine and the sky didn't fall and, we're, and it's all good. So. Is there any nationwide effort or, or any coordinated effort to uh, um, help provide similar um, regulations in other states or even federally to, to either, you can do it several ways, do an outright prohibition or, or taxing the heck out of it? And so, yeah, and so, um, is there anything that's more? So, California, 2019, I think they had a five year phase in, and so they have condors, they have California condors that are even more highly susceptible than our eagles because they scavenge year round, um, and those guys shoot feral, feral pigs in California year round, and so um, they really had a set up there for disaster with the condors, and so. Um, California has gone all, all non-lead for all their hunting. Again, seems to be working fine. I have not heard of another state that's done it that blanketly. Um, I think the states are kind of doing little hodgepodge there. In Iowa, if you're near water, you need to use non-toxic shot, um, but that's about as far as they've gone with some of it. So federally, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the very last days of the Obama administration, um, the Department of the Interior, made a rule that on all federal lands, they were going to require non-lead ammunition. And then when the administration changed, um, that rule went away. And 
So the next step would be, now can it come back? May, yeah, maybe, and so, so, so we will see. And so maybe contacting um, the Department of the Interior and asking for that rule back would be a, would be a really, really fun order. Or it was a director's order. And I bet Lynette has it on our webpage. If yeah. you search for it, you'll find it. <laughs> um, so that would be something that everyone could do, is send a little email and attach that and ask for it to come back. Because that would really lead the way. Like you're saying, if it were something federal, people that want to hunt on National Wildlife Refuges, they would have to abide by that. And then they go, well, if we're all geared up, we'll just keep doing it wherever we go hunting. Are there, are there any conservation organizations, big ones that have to go out that are working on this issue? Um, like uh, Defenders of Wildlife or the Wilderness Society? Or? I think all of those have some little thread, you know, that they might incorporate into their, I think Audubon has been doing oh, some yeah. things, American Bird Conservancy has been doing some things. So I think all of those conservation groups um, recognize this and it's probably a little thread within their big big um, envelope so so we're still working on that that's kind of our resource or our research piece um, doing our programs with it so any more eagle information yeah we'll talk all about eagle nesting mm -hmm. and I you guys yeah that's stuff that you guys all, already all know, but, but usually with the kids, we'll go through that because a lot of them don't realize we're, they grew up with eagles, and in Iowa, we are so fortunate because we have thousands of eagles that come to visit us in the wintertime. We're kind of like this eagle mecca, and so it's kind of gotten to the point where, yeah, I saw 10 of them out in the field the other day. I'm like, not a big deal. And, and it's helpful to remind them. I grew up in Minnesota in the 60s when eagles were on the endangered species list. And even in Minnesota, it would like make the papers that somebody saw an eagle. Um, and so for them to have come back, they were, during the, the very low point, we had 500 nesting pair in the whole lower 48 states. You don't count Alaska, because that's kind of off by itself up there. Um, not, and they they attribute that to, um, you know, and in Iowa, we lost eagles as a nester in the early 1900s because there were no rules. And if you wanted to shoot an eagle in 1900, you could shoot one and you could chop their nest tree down and you could kill the babies. And so in Iowa, they were seen as big predators that were competition and they, didn't, they were not wanted. And so in Iowa, um, the white settlers got rid of the wolves and the bears and the bobcat and anything that might eat something. And the eagles kind of fell into that same category. And we were gone as nesters here, 1906, something like that. Um, and then the rest of the country, the, the big impact was from DDT, the insecticide that impacts how their reproduction goes. And that's, that's <laughs> um, and so that was kind of the final, you know, like the honeybees that came, well, the big collapse was this and this and this and this. It wasn't one thing. It was probably a multiple of factors that, that kind of caused them to fall off the cliff and go into that deep dive and put on the endangered species list. Um, captive breeding and reintroduction and protection of night roots and um, you know, love that protect them from being shot, protect their nests, um, all of those things, and, and getting rid of DDT, all of this, and hopefully being more careful with insecticides in the future, all of those things have combined together, and people loving eagles has really helped too, because now um, they can nest with them in the backyard, and everyone's like, yay, instead of, instead of, oh no, we can just get them out of here. Um, so, oh, I might have you come back this way. Yeah, he, so, so yes, we manage everyone the way he likes it. Everyone needs to be in front of you. Yes, this way. We're like, oh no, before someone comes to get me. Yeah, there you go. We'll just kind of make that. Sorry. 
actually answer? Um, I don't know. And so sometimes the way they explain, because people are working with Osprey too and doing some Osprey reproduction. And the way they explain things, so we were borrowing baby Osprey from northern Minnesota and bringing them to Iowa and putting them in Hack Tower and um, then opening the doors when they had enough feather for supposedly wherever they learn to fly and learn to hunt is where they will come back and nest as a call. So you're tricking Minnesotan osprey into becoming a region osprey. And, uh, and it worked quite well. We now have nesting osprey here in Iowa because of that movement. If we done that, maybe there would have been some pioneers that would have stuck around and stayed in that they come from here on migration. Um, so I don't know if he had a long enough time out. You know, but he had a long enough time to nest. Definitely to be examining the landscape and studying and um, so so not absolutely sure. I would be more sure if he'd been flying around here for, for a few weeks. Then absolutely these guys you know um, <laughs> he's good. He does that all the time. He's a professional. <laughs> He's doing it for his I'm just going to make sure he tied the knot. Yeah. Oh, and so, so that's kind of how they, they do that mapping, is that as they're growing up in the new point, that area really gets in their path. And so I think that's why you see some of the telemetry data um, where they come back and visit. And they're, you know, the, the ones that have spent this summer in Canada, and then boom, all of a sudden they show back up in some Minnesota and Iowa. And so, um, the mapping ability of these guys is from the ground, right? You know, so the flight, the aerial view, I think, is what really helps us in that location. But I, I just got that. Do you have these sensitive trees? So, you, this area is more. We are more prairie, but we um, we have some oak hickory timber, and this is mostly mostly oak. This is a little wetter, a little a few more trees. We are a little dry, more dry and open. Well, and it might be somewhere to go. Yeah, yeah somewhere that looks like a good place to go. To go.
It's happened before. Oh, I can see it happening to me. You mean I'm going to have to, I can't, like, move way over there, and that's okay. You can do the high handheld, just take it off the stand. You'd be like a rock star. Yeah, no, you can be like, you can, you can stand up there. I can do plenty of hand motions from right here. And you can move around in front of the screen, it's okay. I'm just joking. It's getting a little time. All right. There you go. <laughs> now, to, you would know George Strait. You could I sing would. that. That's a that's a hypercardoid mic to try to speak straight into it as much as okay. can. Foolhearted memory or all my exes live in Texas. Which one? <laughs> that's after dinner. I need about yeah, a couple drinks to start singing George Strait. All right. I think we're good to go. I think the broadcast is going here. We've got Mom Decora up here with us. I'm not talking too loud. I don't want to blow your ears out. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this is just uh, incredible to think that we're here meeting together and doing this. Nobody would have thought this a year ago, right, with all the predictions and things that were happening. So thank you for uh, doing whatever you needed to do to get here and and moving forward so it's great to have you here um, we did this virtually 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 last year and I just remember in Willard's garage that Amy and I probably uh, drank at least a couple gallons of water a piece it was quite warm and those computers in there put off quite a lot of heat so <laughs> Uh, I'd much rather do it like here, like we're doing, so. And welcome to everyone that's online. Hopefully you can see this and the broadcast is coming through. So, this is uh, just an update for a Rector Resource Project that I'm going to do here. We've got Mom Decor here, who, which, if, you know, it'd be nice to know if we could get into her brain and understand what Eagles were thinking and why they did it. That might not necessarily bring her back here, but... Um, at least we'd know why, right? This is a beautiful shot of Mom Decora when we were here last year. And it was just like right in the morning when I did the greeting. It's like she's she's welcoming everyone. And I saw, I heard that there was an eagle up on the block that might have been DM2 just a little bit ago. But uh, um, welcome everyone. Where's, so we got people from Texas. We got people from Maryland, right? Okay, anybody further than that? Michigan, Washington, Vermont, Kansas City. Wow, you guys are dedicated. It's, it's great to have you here. So, uh, and 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 you walked, right? That you get extra credit for walking. So uh, that's one of the things I think that I wanted to mention is just how the Eagle Cam and the education program just has brought people together. Um, and just everything else that has stemmed from this. Uh, we, we know, we, we, we've seen with the Falcon work that Bob Anderson was really the, the father of the bird cams. Um, it just, there's no disputing that. Uh, with his research that he was doing before broadcasting and then you know, when the Falcons returned up at the King plant and with May's Internest and 2003 with the Eagle Cam out at Fort St. Brain. Um, and then now, you know, when, when uh, Neil and, and Bob came together to do uh, Eagle, American Eagle, and decided to put the camera up into uh, what we call N1 up uh, at the Holthaus residence. Just amazing to think about what's happened since then, what, 14 years ago now? We start from 2007. Just amazing. Just think of the millions and millions of people that have watched the Eagle Cam. And then, you know, Bob called them copy cams, but everything comes forward, you know, and it's a great idea. We love it that everyone else is doing the same thing. There's so many Eagle Cams out there. There's so many other folks that are doing education 
and raising awareness and connecting people with nature uh, through these nature cameras. That's really the goal. So the more that are out there, the better. That's all I can say. Good quality ones, right? The rated G and PG ones. We can't stop that. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit worse than that, right? Um, so as the cottonwood sways, we really, really never know what uh, is going to happen with those eagles and what they're thinking. Um, really, this year was, was so crazy in so many ways. And what ended up happening is mom and DM2 decided to nest at a different nest. And we don't know exactly the reason why they did that, but it's like, I remember back in 2014, 2015, when I'm driving around in a car with Bob, and he's like, we have to have a backup camera, a backup Eagle camera for this program. This program is way too important for us to miss a season like happened in 2012, 2013. So um, I remember going out and looking at different nests with Bob, and we kind of came to the one that is now the, the Core North Nest. And we might have some visitors tonight, some guests uh, that help us out with that. We'll see if they're able to make it. but. Uh, uh, that connection with the landowner uh, is, is really critical. Um, so it did what it was supposed to do. We had a backup camera, and it really, I don't, it's almost not fair to call it a backup camera. I know all of the mods at DN, all of you folks who watch the Coronor, it's different, and it's unique, and it's beautiful uh, Eagle family. And, and over the years, I've got a, uh, a real soft spot in my heart for the for Mr. North now and DNF uh, um, and the young that they've raised there and just the relationships with uh, families up there that help us bring this out to all of you. It's just a, it's a great thing to be able to do. So we were able to recover even though mom and DM2 decided to abandon us. <laughs> um, they couldn't get away from the cameras and they couldn't get away from the fans though, right? We had fans, uh, uh, Sue and Benny Bruling uh, kind of said, hey, we think this might be a place where they're going, and we started doing some research and checking into it, and voila, we found out that by the absence and presence uh, uh, verification that when they were at the hatchery, they were uh, not at N3, and when they're at N3, they were not at the hatchery, and when one would start going in that direction, it would drive faster than them. And, <laughs> I would see them coming over the hill. Maybe they were stopping to say hi to friends or something. <laughs> Whatever it was, I could get over there before and see that they had shown up and then verify here. So we know it's them. But uh, uh, it really helped out that we have Robin Brum. We've got uh, all the others that have gone over there and they've spent the time to take video and photos and things to help us understand that we do have fledglings this year. D37, D38, and D39. Thanks, nice God. Shakur Eagles. Uh, bring them home. Um, do, they, do you know that it's a dead tree? Geico is going to be calling you soon and saying that you're not covered. I'm say. You don't want to get those out of warranty calls, you know? It's calling about the extended warranty on your nest, and your tree is dead, I'm sorry. It doesn't apply. So, the Decorah North Nest is where we, we really migrated towards this year, and, and uh, it was an amazing year, Decorah North. Um, it started out, uh, I remember, and, and remember that Decorah North, along with N2B, is a nest that, that we rebuilt. Um, I remember, you know, helping design, and you know, Amy and PK were up in the nest, and me and Rich and others were down on the ground sending stuff up to them. But uh, that nest was recreated in 2018, and the Eagles loved it, and things have been going well ever since. Um, this year was a banner year. We had 2018. The new nest was built. You know, will they come? They came right away, and we think that that first eagle that showed up was DNA. Um, that took our trout that we left, their little trout presence. Nest cam set up in 2015 um, with, with three different families that are part of that, that property in the Black flies, you know, this is part of the history. It, it happened in 2019. It's in uh, 
superpowered eagles, eagle power, uh, DN9, you know, was part of that crew that uh, basically went into rehab at SOAR and then was uh, soft released down in mid Iowa. DN9 fell, recovered from rehab. That's just some history. 2020, 2021 seasons, you know, were, were pretty great. I think we we had a, we lost uh, DN11, was it? You know, the year before this this year, but we had a great flood and uh, DN11, DN12 was. Was it the N12? The N12 pledge. Yeah. The N12 pledged and, and gave us a great show after that for I, I remember quite some time. And then this year, 13 and 14, it's like, do we think that they're a male and a female? Is that what you guys are saying? That's what I hear online, so sometimes you guys are the experts. Brother and sister are giving us quite the show, aren't they? So here's our Eagles, Mr. North, very handsome guy. There's Deanna, she's got that fierce look. She says, I got what it takes. And she did, because I think this picture was taken at like 12 to 15 below. And they, they never cease to give us comical moments. Here, De here Mr. North came in, and he's, he's basically rearranging the nest and doing stuff while she's incubating the eggs. It's like, I don't even know that you're here, or I think you need a different hairdo, a feather do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress you up a little bit. So you can see the frost on her feathers. I mean, this is another one. You can see the frost, the little mini ice, micro ice crystals on their feathers. It was so cold out. And then Mr. North, he knows how to put a show on with the pheasant feathers, the turkey feathers. It's like, you know, hey, I'm ready to go out to dinner here. Looking pretty sharp. So this this February and this March were just nothing short of amazing. We've had this happen one other year where uh, we had over a foot of snow and the eggs were laid and they kept the eggs and that center donut hole of the nest pretty much covered up by by being there. And then they get up and they shed the snow a couple times through the snowstorm with their wings and then they'll rearrange the eggs a little bit and get back down. But to fit that almost three foot body and get that brood patch down to incubate those eggs at that, you know, with that a foot or a foot plus of snow there is, is just crazy amazing. I mean, we've always wondered, are they going to make it? Are those eggs going to hatch? And I think each time we've had that kind of snowstorm, I can't remember the first year, but this year it was twice we had two of those and both eggs hatch. So um, they do an amazing job. They're very well equipped and, and able to handle that. So we're learning that through experience. There's another movie coming out next year that we were working on video footage and I'll just tell you, I can't tell you who it is or who's going to put it on, but this footage from the core north is, is on that, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing stuff. So, we're keeping the education going through movies, you know, across the world and across the country. They work great together, I mean, this is like, hey, it's your turn, it's your shift, you know, get over here. So, um, you know, right after that snowstorm, the second one, here's a, uh, um, it looks like DNF, I think, uh, calling out Mr. North. And we're passing through the eggs and the hatching here, but uh, there's our little uh, little fuzzy beauties there. And look at the transformation. Pretty amazing. Like I said, they have given us an incredible year of viewing and just uh, watching. Uh, in the absence of not having uh, uh, activity at M2B here at Patchery. And this is just a, a couple days ago, I think. Uh, um, just uh, uh, tender moments of eagle siblings, I guess. That's, that's what I'll say. We do research. Um, uh, we've got cam operators that are a network, and they network together, and they record every piece of food that comes up there. 
Um, it's just amazing. Uh, shout out to our cam operators, um, you know, uh, Smitha, Liz, uh, Dave, who is here, Sandy, who is here, uh, and others, uh, Mikey. Um, just, it's been an amazing year of just, uh, I, I used to do this myself and try to do most all the cam operating in the early years and I know that we would not be able to do anything like what we're doing right now if we didn't have all the volunteer help with the cam operators. They do a wonderful job. So this shows uh, the Core North Nest food prey feeding totals for 2020-2021 season. Um, we've got it breaking out by Mr. North, DNF, um, by prey, fish heads, pieces, feedings, self-feedings, uh, after uh, uh, the, the young started feeding themselves. So some very interesting statistics. We've got that to compare with other years. We've got some really interesting data that I presented between the North Nest and uh, the Decorah Nest here at the hatchery, and you think that there'd be a huge difference because this is right next to the trout hatchery, but we found that there really wasn't that much difference in the number of fish and the number of meals that were brought up. They were very, very close. I remember presenting that last year and was quite surprised how even things were between the two nests. Um, there's no cow yeti down here at all. Um, that, that's, uh, there's, there's cattle there, and, and when they have a baby, the, the placenta and leftovers that are there, that's a food source that those eagles use. So that's what cow getty is. So here Pieces, unidentified food objects, furry pelts and bones, one raccoon, 20 fawn, uh, 20 cow getty, 11 rabbit, 9 muskrat. And I think I also had a few bell box, which was kind of sad. The change with the M2. Um, they did change nest. Uh, we think that they probably were working on M3 before 2020. Uh, probably back as early as 2019. Um, and we saw them fall over the hill towards the upper Iowa. Remember that season ended pretty early with the flies. Um, we lost track of uh, GM2, I think, early in, in the summer. We think probably not the town. That you know, was the most fun part of the tour. <laughs> he, I think he dragged mom over that way. We know that mom was here ever since she and dad. The uh, here in 27, 2007, 2008. So she's been here, and you think about that, up to this year, 36 eaglets, six hatch, hatch N1, N2, 100 cards. Um, so the this new nest is. You know, there is 37, 38, and 39. That's like, um, some food to take it to them. Some food in their ears and get raffle pets when they're making that transition between fed by parents to you're going to be on your own in a couple months, and you're going to be taking that migration wherever, too. So. Um, Mom and DM2, we've been seeing them spend more time here. That's great. We hope that that's some kind of indication that, you know, they're going to like this area and come back. We'll see. No one knows. And that is the big question. Will they return back closer here, come back to M2 here? Some amazing photos, I mean, that you guys have been getting. Uh, this is from the Millers. Uh, 
Uh, they were here uh, for two weeks and just left a little bit ago, but beautiful shot of Mom Decor coming in and landing on the, the new maple tree. It was just an amazing shot. Like, uh, that blackbird is like, I know you can't do anything to me. I'm faster than you, and I can do it. Look at me. I can do this just, just like you. It's almost like a perfect mimicking shot. But, uh, you know, they're around. Everyone has got to see. I know DM2 and Mom were on the maple tree uh, two days ago. Not yesterday, but the day before, early in the morning before I got here. So they are spending time here. It's still a great place to see eagles. It's still a great place to get photographs of eagles. Oops. And here's N3. And here's a shot of two of the eaglets. You can see it's a dead tree. We can see that it's a totally different tree shape, almost like a ice cream glass you know, very steep angles, and they'd have to build up there quite a bit to get any more surface area. And it's a dead tree, so hopefully hopefully they follow that rule of uh, eagles don't like to nest in dead trees, right? You want that cover. Come back. So again, thanks to all uh, the photographers that have been getting shots and video or whatever of, of uh, Mom and DM2 that we have been able to keep up with shift here. I'm just going to talk about a few of the other cameras that we've got. I can't focus a lot of time on all of them, but this is one of my favorites, the Kestrel Cam. It's the Wisconsin Kestrels. It's a collaborative project with Cornell and with Neil Reddick Productions, Neil Reddick and Laura Johnson down at their farm. Um, it's interesting because uh, Kestrels are really good artists and their medium is the camera lens and what they do it with is their mutes, their poop shoot. And so they kept us busy cleaning that cam lines. We need to move that thing a little bit further away. It was a successful year. As I mentioned, this is our partnership with Cornell, uh, Neil and Laura. Fourth year of the live cam. Last year we got cut short, five beautiful eggs, and then the female disappeared. We thought maybe a pooper sock had gotten her. Neil had said that there was a pooper sock that was hanging around. That happens in the raptor world. Male and female uh, uh, courted, laid five eggs. We had a great year. Um, five healthy young fledged, and I think it was all like within the same day. Um, uh, and I, I watched a couple of those fledged videos that Amy posted, and it was bare, the, the parents could barely even come into that nest box hole with any kind of prey, and they were just mobbed by those five young. It was just crazy to watch, crazy to look at. And those, those videos are still there. If you want to go out and see it. Here's just a shot of the two uh, uh, adults. There's a little uh, uh, perch there, and it's built right into the barn. It's uh, the hole's there, and there's a whole nest box in there. We've got a light tube that provides artificial light, perfectly timed with the sun, and earth rotation, and you know, natural light coming in there. And we've got a blower there and some other things that we have to actually, in the black fly years, the last couple of years, we've actually had to pump air through there and actually do some treating of the nest box with insecticide just to, just for them to actually live. So you know how bad those black flies can affect pestles too. There's just a shot of, of a female with the young, the five young. That's before they could really do damage with their open mouths and talons. And here's one of the feedings right before that I was mentioning. And the noise and the speed of the, the uh, vocalizations and dashing around, it's pretty incredible to watch. All right, let's go to falcon cams. And this year was an incredible year of learning for us. Um, we've never seen this on cam. Um, we got chances to talk to our falconer uh, uh, board members and others that we know just to try to understand what was going on. I mean, we, we thought we had ideas, but it's like, hey, we need to confirm this. This is really some interesting behavior that's going on. So here's Great Spirit Bluff. This is where I grew up, just north of La Crescent, Apple Blossom Scenic Drive, right on the mighty Mississippi River. It looks out over Lake Onalaska. This is where the mist box is that Bob uh, 
basically set up with my, my dad and family, and that's how I got involved with the Raptor Resource Project. But a beautiful bluff along the Mississippi River. The uh, nest box is, uh, let's see if I can, nest box is about right in here, I believe. Cam is over here, and maybe the nest box is right there. The nest box is right there. Newman return, that was the first thing. I didn't get too fancy with all the, the slides here. There was a lot of drama going on. Our, our female from the year before basically uh, uh, got into a pretty knock-down, drag-out fight with, uh, was it Nina? Uh, Nina yeah. and Nova. And uh, maybe something happened to uh, Nova. She was the one who prevailed. It looked like Nina left. Nova came back, at least for that day, and then we never saw her again. So. Uh, something may have happened to her during that fight, which looked pretty intense. A um, day or so later, a very young female, um, a second year female shows up, which is now Zoe. That was the name that we gave her, the new, new girl, right? And Newman obviously had to teach her the ropes, right? Uh, there's no ropes involved here. It's either cam arms or branches or trees or whatever, but um, as you know, it's just swiping tails across. It's not like, you know, it's pretty, pretty, it's PG, right? <laughs> now, the number of times they were doing it a day, I don't know about that, but um, whatever. Um, falcons are pretty prolific, just like other raptors, but hey, they were successful. Um, we were very excited that we got three eggs laid. The first egg was laid, and then almost two weeks came before number two came. But then right on schedule, two to three days after that, we got egg number three. There were some inconsistencies with what we normally see, with incubation starting at the third egg, that long delay between one, egg one and egg two. And then we also had a couple times where it looked like one of the eggs got kicked out, and they were only incubating two eggs for a while. One of them was up, probably up, sitting behind the next nest box uh, front board. Um, but they did make it back, and they all must have gotten incubated. We saw them on three eggs, and we had three hatch. So uh, it just shows the resilience of that developing egg and, and how it can, it can survive some of those temperature changes and fluctuations like that. And delayed incubation can go that long before. I think once the incubation is started, it's a lot harder to have those delays um, with incubation once it gets started. But up until it's that delayed incubation starts, there's there's a little bit of a window of time there. So, our third IS here, there is Chance. We call it Chance the Raptor, and Chance, I think, because we saw so many things that happened or could have happened that were just going to get in the way of any falcon surviving this year. So, we as a new female, we confirmed this with our board member, Jim Robinson. They will shuffle, incessantly shuffle, almost to the point where they're, they're basically de-feathering their young. Um, and uh, so uh, we saw maybe some minor things that happened. Uh, it took a little bit longer for Chance to be able to stand, and some of that might have been just the, you know, getting light coordination and things after all the shuffling going on. Um, Amy and I did get down. The two that came before Chance, did not make it, and uh, basically it was that time period where the, the innate behavior and the learned behavior con connected, and you know she finally figured out after uh, two did not make it that she got the hang of it that these pieces of food you know need to be smaller, and she was able to get enough nourishment into that little bitty tiny beak. Um, I'll never forget the first time. Now looking back, it's kind of funny. Uh, that she laid a blackbird right in front of the newly hatched uh, young, and it's like, hey, here it is. <laughs> Come on, how come you're not eating? And, you know, unfortunately it took two uh, young, uh, beautiful young falcons, uh, uh, and, and that, you know, that, that's the way it works. Got it figured out on the third one. Now look at Chance. This is showing her beautiful wings. She's just about ready to fledge. We think that's going to happen any day now. Amy and I did go down and treat her uh, at a little over a week old uh, for parasites, hippoboscids. We used a, 
a insecticide that's uh, good for birds that we know works. We use it for black flies, and now we know it's good and effective for hippoboscids too. This is what it looked like, I think, yesterday. That's what the Mississippi River looks like on these days with these temperature changes. Beautiful cloud lake is what we call this. It's one of the beautiful times where you can't see I-90 below, and I-90 is great to have, but it's nice not to see it once in a while. And there's Chance ready to take the skies any day now. Flyway cam. Flyway cam is just something that uh, um, that was, you know, let's get let's get away from man-made structures as much as we can, and let's get right out in the middle of nature. Let's set ourselves down there, and let's have an experience like you can't really have, you know, unless you have something that's not human out there recording it for you. So, Mississippi River Flyway Cam. It's our partnership with the National Wildlife and Fish Service out of Bryce Prairie, uh, Bryce Prairie Conservation Association, and Explore.org. Started, moderated chat in 2019, and that's gone awesome. We got a lot of our mods here in the audience uh, today, and have been here this week. A model for other organizations. Many have reached out and said, "How are you guys doing this? Will you help us with this?" Uh, Madison Audubon, we've been helping them and others, uh, just uh, doing a little bit of work, helping out the National uh, Eagle Center with some of their cameras and things too. So it's great to be able to share that and, and help people see these beautiful creatures that we get to steward along and live side by side with. Uh, serves as a source of information and enjoyment for men. It's just a really cool shot near sunset. There's two eagles doing their tumble that everybody loves to see uh, in the air just uh, playing around. Egret, beautiful shots. Way too many species for me to show everything here, just some examples. Uh, everybody appears to get along, you know? Um, tundra swans here, eagles, ducks, or geese. Here we got the pelicans. This is just recent. The pelican pods have come back. The pelicans are coming. It's one of the first ones coming back uh, uh, this time of year. We get to see them fishing. And it's just some more shots of a, a seagull and some eaglets. And it's a Sora, yeah. This is a bird called a Sora, and it likes cattails and marshes. And um, it's the first time I've seen one. I had to reach out to my nephew, the ornithologist. Uh, maybe you might have known, but I just, uh, it's like, what is this? It's so cool looking. Um, I just saw that this week. So, moving on. Uh, Missouri turkey vultures, we got to bring back one of the cams that Bob started up, I believe it was in 2011, uh, 2012, with uh, Chuck and John uh, down in uh, Missouri, uh, in Marshall, Missouri. And they got a hold of Bob and said, we got turkey vultures in our barn, how'd you like to put a cam down here? We had a couple years where it worked out great, then there was a family with uh, uh, some dogs and kids and it just didn't work out. And uh, things changed, and it was back to, hey, we had a successful year last year, let's get that cam going again. So this has been a really cool year to see the turkey vultures. I believe it's the only turkey vulture cam out there in the world right now. Um, and this might be the only one pretty much ever. But uh, we've got one of the adults sunning there, which is one of the coolest things to watch turkey vultures do, is spread their wings, and they got that bluish purplish cast to their wings. You can't see it here, but you can see the glowing sun on the back in the shadow. Here's the two young now. The watchers call them little bits. They're not so little anymore. Um, they're going to be losing their down, and now you can see they're stretching out those wings, and they're, they're getting ready to, to fledge here sometime in the next couple weeks. Very good monitoring. We had a banner year. This was an awesome year. Um, very rewarding in many ways. One, we didn't have to wear masks all the time. <laughs> it was much more enjoyable that way in the heat. Um, we banded 80 falcons, and there's probably about another 8 or 10 that were too old for us to even try on cliff sites. Um, if they're old enough that they look like we could possibly push them off, um, we won't take a chance. And I know Harper's Ferry or Leo's Bluff was one. Uh, I think uh, 
Mawson's, Mawson's Bluff, south of Nelson, Twin Bluffs, Wisconsin was one. So there's a number of them that we couldn't get to. So we could have been close to pushing 90, and that would have been, I think, a record. Uh, so we're finding some more net sites, uh, natural ones, and um, our, our monitoring and banding program is strong as it's ever been. Here, uh, um, this, uh, I guess, Effigy Mounds last year was just an a, a amazing moment where, where Bob and uh, John Dingley and Dave Kester and the group that raised the Peregrine Falcons and left him here and then released them over a two-year period at FG Mounds off of Hanging Rock. Uh, that monumental uh, event where they basically helped the falcon figure out and remember where it came from. Most of them were going towards square, shop, square shaped nest boxes on bluffs or other buildings and they were not going back to the natural iries and potholes and they figured it was nest site imprinting and they were correct and two years after they did that release they started showing up Lansing, uh, uh, Queens Bluff and, and uh, uh, Maiden Rock. The Mawson's I believe were some of the first ones. Maybe Castle Rock was too. So just some amazing research that was done and, and that work that Bob and the Raptor Research Project did, that's what made this banding for the last two years so special. So 29 site visit. This is a shot from last year. This is that uh, we were banding uh, Bob and, and Maggie, um, named after Bob and Maggie Jones. Um, and it was just monumental. It was, it was one of those experiences that you never forget. And here's some of our uh, falcons at Redbird Bluff. So let's talk a little bit about D37. D35, D36. You guys heard out. Anyone who came to the telemetry uh, demonstration today got to learn that if you didn't know already that D35 was found dead and that she died because of lead poisoning. You know that the females are more susceptible to lead poisoning than the male eagles are. So I guess unfortunately that that makes sense. There's number six shot, probably you know some BB shot from small game or bird hunting. D27 is currently right around here, you know, upper Iowa River, just a little bit west of town. Sometimes she's been hanging just a little bit south of town here. Uh, so she's still around. She's probably got a white head now. She's probably just about getting ready to find a mate and maybe set out on territory one of these days. D36, we know that he's been hanging out uh, up towards Camp, uh, uh, Harmony, Preston and Chatfield, Chatfield area. High water, we know it's the root river. So here's D35 and D36 uh, right here at the hatchery the year that they were dispersing. They look like they're all ready to go, standing straight up and just for the camera. I think they were hams. Here's that shot uh, showing where D27 has been hanging out. Cora, Upper Iowa River, Trout Creek. Here's that shot that Amy put together, which is really cool. It kind of shows how much an eagle can really see when they're up in the, in, in the sky. So it's, it's totally different, the perspective that they see when they're in the air. So how do they navigate and find these rivers and valleys and, and, and find prey and find other eagles, it's easy. They've got the eyesight to do it, and they've got the height to do it. So here is just a simulation of Chatfield, and here's the Cora, and you can easily see how they could follow that riverine system and make their way back down to the Cora. Classroom. Um, the pandemic hit. We had just put out our virtual education program. Um, our teacher group, a bunch of them are here. We got some of our teacher education group folks here right now, right? Yep. Lori and Meg is here, I think. Right? And Deb. Any others? Um, but anyway, thanks for what you do. Uh, we got some cool content that people are using in the classroom, and one of one of the things that we are working on right now with with Jeff Worrell, our new uh, employee uh, is to D 
get this material out to the classrooms and really help teachers and, and others realize and know that this material is there for them. So we might be having a conference to uh, bring some of those teachers in and teach them and show them how to use that, but that's, that's in the works right now. You can see we've got the, we've got the educational chat. Um, back uh, last time we counted, uh, we had about 1,500 classrooms that have logged in and asked for access to the resources. So we know that folks are seeing this without us really trying too hard. So if we start getting the word out that this stuff is for, out there for you guys, we really think that this could really take off more than it has already. Guest moderators, these kids come in, they know so much about eagles, they probably know more than some, in some areas than, than I could answer. Um, this is our core mission, is really connecting kids and, and people with nature through bald eagles, through peregrine falcons, through the flyway, through uh, you know, restoration efforts and conservation efforts. Just some examples of some of the stuff that they produce. Math, weight, other core and STEM subjects that they work on. Here's some shots of uh, that in action. And here's some mantle, uh, Gloria, uh, some of the verb, verb uh, demonstrations of showing their verbs. Mantle and soar. I've been in the classroom when they do this stuff and it's just precious. <laughs> It's precious to see kids learning this way and doing this stuff, and then talking to the families about it afterwards. It really is a kind of learning that um, is more efficient and effective a lot of times than reading stuff out of a book. Okay, our banding station, not gonna talk a whole lot about that, but we did have two banding stations. Um, we saw lots of species. We have uh, stipends that we do with Luther College. Um, and we were hand in hand with them. We're on Luther property up on Hawk Hill. And we set up two blinds, one on Hawk Hill and one over at the Reddick Farm this last year. And we, we, the students got lots of experience. We masked up, we had filtration units and things to protect through COVID, pro COVID protocol. We made it through that successfully. So um, it was a very successful year. Uh, Dave Kester will probably be here later if you want to talk to him about any of that program. It's a, it's an amazing program. It was funded for two years by an IDNR REAP grant, and we've, we loved it. We've been running it every year based on contributions from all, you all and others that, uh, that help support us. It's such an important program. Just some examples. Here's Sophia Landis, who also claims and, and bans falcons with us and does monitoring. This is a perfect example of bringing new uh, researchers and new people up through the ranks. Sophia started out in the banding station and um, now she's helping us out on, on, on multiple fronts. So bringing in, training in the new guard, right? There's an example of Dave Kester and Emily Neal here right in the decor of schools, training and teaching some of the kids. They got a curriculum that they get pre-approved in advance by the school district and they come into different grades and do a program and those birds that they're catching up on Hawk Hill, they'll let the teachers know and then they'll come down and do the release and do a, a program outside with the kids. We have the Robert Anderson Memorial Scholar Scholarship Rams program and that's going strong. It's self-funding now. Thank you so much for all your donations. Anyone can still make donations to that. Right now we're funding a $1,500 scholarship annually to a student at, at Luther College right now that's in an environmental science or biology coursework program. And you know we've done that, this is our third year now that we've offered that. And the, the funding is, is uh, just the returns on the money through the Community Foundation of Northeast Iowa. They're the ones who manage that fund for us. It's self-sustaining now. And someday we'll add to it, maybe we can sponsor two students. Philippine Eagle, we're making progress there. We might be working on a monumental program to help them draw in some funding resources and some, some uh, uh, famous people, some entertainers and others to help with the Philippine Eagle effort to help this most endangered eagle in the world and help uh, educate the Philippine folks just like Cornell and like Neil Reddick and Laura Johnson and others have already been doing 
It's a successful program with Bird of Prey and some of the other programs that have been shown over there. Um, they'd like, we'd like to try to help them with that breeding program and take that to the next level. Just a shot of that, and you can go to Amazon and you can rent uh, Bird of Prey for 15 bucks anytime you want and watch that amazing movie. What's coming for 2022? Nest cam prep maintenance, September, November. We look forward to that every year. We get to invite our good friend T.K. Arnold back in from San Francisco and help us out. We got new eagle location in Decora. You know, we need to have that backup cam and we can't trust uh, that they're going to nest an M2B. So we probably will be finding another eagle nest here close by. We've got some good prospects and camming up another nest here uh, this fall, just so we do have a backup nest, just in case something happened at the Coronar, which was our main Eagle Cam for our education program this year. ...to give us comical moments here. Dad, here Mr. North came in, and he's, he's basically rearranging the nest and doing stuff while she's incubating the egg. It's like... I don't even know that you're here, or I think you need a different hairdo, a feather do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress you up a little bit. So you can see the frost on her feathers. I mean, this is another one. You can see the frost, the little mini ice, micro ice crystals on their feathers. It was so cold out. And then Mr. North, he knows how to put a show on with the pheasant feathers, the turkey feathers. It's like, you know, hey, I'm ready to go out to dinner here. Looking pretty sharp. So this this February and this March were just nothing short of amazing. We've had this happen one other year where uh, we had over a foot of snow and the eggs were laid and they kept the eggs and that center donut hole of the nest pretty much covered up by by being there. And then they get up and they shed the snow a couple times through the snowstorm with their wings and then they'll rearrange the eggs a little bit and get back down. But to fit that almost three foot body and get that brood patch down to incubate those eggs at that, you know, with that a foot or a foot plus of snow there is, is just crazy amazing. I mean, we've always wondered, are they going to make it? Are those eggs going to hatch? And I think each time we've had that kind of snowstorm, I can't remember the first year, but this year it was twice we had two of those, and both eggs hatch. So um, they do an amazing job. They're very well equipped and, and able to handle that. So we're learning that through experience. There's another movie coming out next year that we were working on video footage, and I'll just tell you, I can't tell you who it is or who's going to put it on, but this footage from the Cora North is, is on that. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing. We're keeping the education going through movies, you know, across the world and across the country. They work great together. I mean, this is like, hey, it's your turn. It's your shift. You know, get over here. So, um, you know, right after that snowstorm, the second one, here's a, uh, um, that looks like DNF, I think, uh, calling out Mr. North. And we're passing through the eggs and the hatching here, but uh, there's our little uh, little fuzzy beauties there. And look at the transformation. Pretty amazing. Like I said, they have given us an incredible year of viewing and just uh, watching uh, in the absence of not having uh, uh, activity at M2B here at Patchery. And this is just a, a couple days ago, I think. Uh, um, just uh, uh, tender moments of eagle siblings, I guess. That's that's what I'll say. We do research. Um, uh, we've got cam operators that are a network, and they network together, and they record every piece of food that comes up there. Um, it's just amazing. A uh, shout out to our cam operators. Um, you know, uh, Smitha, Liz, uh, Dave, who is here, Sandy, who is here, uh, and others, uh, Mikey. Um, just, it's been an amazing year of just uh, 
I, I used to do this myself and try to do most all the cam operating in the early years and I know that we would not be able to do anything like what we're doing right now if we didn't have all the volunteer help with the cam operators. They do a wonderful job. So this shows uh, Decor North Nest food prey feeding totals for 2020-2021 season. Um, we've got it breaking out by Mr. North, DNF, um, by prey, fish heads, pieces, feedings, self-feedings, uh, after uh, uh, the, the young started feeding himself. So some very interesting statistics. We've got that to compare with other years. We've got some really interesting data that I presented between the North Nest and uh, the Decorah Nest here at the hatchery, and you'd think that there'd be a huge difference because this is right next to the trout hatchery, but we found that there really wasn't that much difference in the number of fish and the number of meals that were brought up. They were very, very close. I remember presenting that last year and I was quite surprised how even things were between the two nests. Um, there's no cow getty down here at all. Um, but, that's, uh, there's, there's cattle there, and, and when they have a baby, the, the placenta and leftovers that are there, that's a food source that those eagles use. So that's what cow get. Is. So here we got that top, top food item is fish. Pieces, unidentified food objects, furry pelts and bones, one raccoon, 20 fawn, uh, 20 cow getty, 11 rabbit, 9 muskrat. And I think I also had a few bell box, which was kind of sad. year after the mate change with the M2. Um, they did change nest. Uh, we think that they probably were working on M3 before 2020. Uh, probably back as early as 2019. Um, and we saw them pull over the hill towards the upper Iowa Remember that season ended pretty early with the flies. Um, we lost track of uh, DM2, I think, early in, in the summer. We think probably out of the town. I was in the next part of the tour. <laughs> he, I think he dragged mom over that way. We know that mom was here ever since she and dad were uh, here in 27, 2007, 2008. So, been here, and you think about that, up to this year, 36 eaglets, six hatch, hatch N1, N2, B, 100 cards. Um, so the best way where this new nest is, he's, he's 37, 38, and 39. That's like, um, some food to take it to them, he's all food in their ears, and get rectal pets when they're making that transition between fed by parents to you're going to be on your own in a couple months, and you're going to be taking that migration wherever, too, so... Um, Mom and DM2, we've been seeing them spend more time here. That's great. We hope that that's some kind of indication that, you know, they're going to like this area and come back. We'll see. No one knows. And that is the big question. Will they return back closer here, come back to M2? Some amazing photos, I mean, that you guys have been getting. Uh, this is from the Millers. Uh, uh, they were here uh, for two weeks and just left a little bit ago, but beautiful shot of Mom Decor coming in and landing on the, the new maple tree. Here's just an amazing shot. Like, uh, that blackbird is like, 
I know you can't do anything to me. I'm faster than you, and I can do it. Look at me. I can do this just, just like you. It's almost like a perfect mimicking shot. But, uh, you know, they're around. Everyone has got to see. I know DM2 and Mom were on the maple tree uh, two days ago. Not yesterday, but the day before, early in the morning before I got here. So they are spending time here. It's still a great place to see eagles. It's still a great place to get photographs of eagles. And here's N3, and here's a shot of two of the eaglets. You can see it's a dead tree. We can see that it's a totally different tree shape, almost like a ice cream glass, you know, very steep angles. And they'd have to build up there quite a bit to get any more surface area. And it's a dead tree, so hopefully, hopefully they follow that rule of uh, eagles don't like to nest in dead trees, right? You want that cover. Come back. So again, thanks to all uh, the photographers that have been getting shots and video or whatever of, of uh, mom and DM2 that we have been able to keep up with. Shift here, I'm just going to talk about a few of the other cameras that we've got. And I can't focus a lot of time on all of them, but this is one of my favorites, the Kestrel Cam. It's the Wisconsin Kestrels. It's a collaborative project with Cornell and with Neil Reddig Productions, Neil Reddig and Laura Johnson down at their farm. Um, it's interesting because uh, kestrels are really good artists, and their medium is the camera lens, and what they do it with is their mutes, their poop shoot. And so they kept us busy cleaning that camera lens. We need to move that thing a little bit further away. It was a su successful year. As I mentioned, this is our partnership with Cornell, uh, Neil and Laura. Fourth year of the live cam. Last year we got cut short. Five beautiful eggs and then the female disappeared. We thought maybe a cooper's hawk had gotten her. Neil had said that there was a cooper's hawk that was hanging around. That happens in the raptor world. Male and female uh, uh, courted, laid five eggs. We had a great year. Um, five healthy young fledged and I think it was all like within the same day. Um, uh, and I, I watched the couple of those fledged videos that Amy posted and it was bare, the, the parents could barely even come into that nest box hole with any kind of prey and they were just mobbed by those five young. It was just crazy to watch, crazy to look at. And those, those videos are still there if you want to go out and see it. Here's just a shot of the two uh, uh, adults. There's a little uh, uh, perch there and it's built right into the barn. It's uh, the holes there, and there's a whole nest box in there. We've got a light tube that provides artificial light, perfectly timed with the sun, and earth rotation, and you know, natural light coming in there. And we've got a blower there, and some other things that we have to actually, in the black fly years, the last couple of years, we've actually had to pump air through there and actually do some treating of the nest box with insecticide just to just for them to actually live. So. You know how bad those black flies can affect kestrels too. There's just a shot of of a female with the uh, young, the five young. That's before they could really do damage with their open mouths and talons. And here's one of the feedings right before that I was mentioning, and the noise and the speed of the the uh, vocalizations and the dashing around. It's pretty incredible to watch. All right, let's go to falcon cams. And this year was an incredible year of learning for us. Um, we've never seen this on cam. Um, we got chances to talk to our falconer uh, uh, board members and others that we know just to try to understand what was going on. I mean, we, we thought we had ideas, but it's like, hey, we need to confirm this. This is really some interesting behavior that's going on. So, here's Great Spear Bluff. This is where I grew up, just north of La Crescent, Apple Blossom Scenic Drive, right on the mighty Mississippi River. It looks out over Lake on Alaska. This is where the nest box is that Bob uh, basically set up with my, my dad and family, and that's how I got involved with the Raptor Resource Project. But a beautiful bluff along the Mississippi River. The uh, nest box is, uh, let's see if I can, nest box is about right in here, I believe. 
Kim is over here. And maybe the nest box is right there. The nest box is right there. Newman returned. That was first thing. I didn't get too fancy with all the, the slides here. There was a lot of drama going on. Our, our female from the year before basically uh, uh, got into a pretty knock-down, drag-out fight with, uh, was it Nina? Uh, Nina yeah. and Nova. And uh, maybe something happened to uh, Nova. She was the one who prevailed. It looked like Nina left. Nova came back, at least for that day, and then we never saw her again. So. Uh, something may have happened to her during that fight, which looked pretty intense. Uh, a day or so later, a very young female, um, a second year female shows up, which is now Zoe. That was the name that we gave her, the new, new girl, right? And Newman obviously had to teach her the ropes, right? Uh, there's no ropes involved here. It's either cam arms or branches or trees or whatever, but um, as you know, it's just swiping tails across. It's not like, you know, it's pretty, pretty, it's PG, right? <laughs> now, the number of times they were doing it a day, I don't know about that, but um, whatever. Um, falcons are pretty prolific, just like other raptors, but hey, they were successful. Um, we were very excited that we got three eggs laid. The first egg was laid, and then almost two weeks came before number two came. But then right on schedule, two to three days after that, we got egg number three. There were some inconsistencies with what we normally see, with incubation starting at the third egg, that long delay between one, egg one and egg two. And then we also had a couple times where it looked like one of the eggs got kicked out, and they were only incubating two eggs for a while. One of them was up, probably up, sitting behind the next nest box uh, front board. Um, but they did make it back, and they all must have gotten incubated. We saw them on three eggs, and we had three hatch. So uh, it just shows the resilience of that developing egg and, and how it can, it can survive some of those temperature changes and fluctuations like that. And delayed incubation can go that long before. I think once the incubation is started, it's a lot harder to have those delays um, with incubation once it gets started. But up until it's that delayed incubation starts, there's there's a little bit of a window of time there. So, our third IS here, there is Chance. We call it Chance the Raptor, and Chance, I think, because we saw so many things that happened or could have happened that were just going to get in the way of any falcon surviving this year. So we, as a new female, we confirmed this with our board member, Jim Robinson. They will shuffle, incessantly shuffle, almost to the point where they're, they're basically de-feathering their young. Um, and uh, so um, we saw maybe some minor things that happened. Uh, it took a little bit longer for Chance to be able to stand, and some of that might have been just the, you know, getting light coordination and things after all the shuffling going on. Um, Amy and I did get down. The two that came before Chance, did not make it, and uh, basically it was that time period where the, the innate behavior and the learned behavior con connected, and you know she finally figured out after uh, two did not make it that she got the hang of it that these pieces of food you know need to be smaller, and she was able to get enough nourishment into that little bitty tiny beak. Um, I'll never forget the first time. Now looking back, it's kind of funny. Uh, that she laid a blackbird right in front of the newly hatched uh, young, and it's like, hey, here it is. <laughs> Come on, how come you're not eating? And, you know, unfortunately it took two uh, young, uh, beautifully young falcons, uh, uh, and, and that, you know, that, that's the way it works. Got it figured out on the third one. Now look at Chance. This is showing her beautiful wings. She's just about ready to fledge. We think that's going to happen any day now. Amy and I did go down and treat her uh, at a little over a week old uh, for parasites. Hippoboscids, we used a, a insecticide that's uh, good for birds that we know works. We use it for black flies, and now we know it's good and effective for hippoboscids too. This is what it looked like, I think, yesterday. That's what the Mississippi River looks like on these days with these temperature changes. Beautiful. Cloud Lake is what we call this. 
one of the beautiful times where you can't see I-90 below, and I-90 is great to have, but it's nice not to see it once in a while. And there's Chance ready to take the skies any day now. Flyway cam. Flyway cam is just something that uh, um, that was. You know, let's get let's get away from man-made structures as much as we can, and let's get right out in the middle of nature. Let's set ourselves down there, and let's have an experience like you can't really have, you know, unless you have something that's not human out there recording it for you. So. Mississippi River Flyway Cam. It's our partnership with the National Wildlife and Fish Service out of Bryce Prairie, uh, Bryce Prairie Conservation Association, and Explore.org. Started, moderated chat in 2019, and that's gone awesome. We got a lot of our mods here in the audience uh, today, and have been here this week. A model for other organizations. Many have reached out and said, "How are you guys doing this? Will you help us with this?" Uh, Madison Audubon, we've been helping. Them and others uh, just uh, doing a little bit of work helping out the National uh, Eagle Center with some of their cameras and things too. So it's great to be able to share that and, and help people see these beautiful creatures that we get to steward along and live side by side with. Uh, serves as a source of information and enjoyment for men. There's just a really cool shot near sunset. There's two eagles doing their tumble that everybody loves to see. Uh, in the air, just uh, playing around. Egret, beautiful shots. Way too many species for me to show everything here, just some examples. Uh, everybody appears to get along, you know? Um, Tundra swans here, eagles, ducks, or geese. Here we got the pelicans. This is just recent. The pelican pods have come back. The pelicans are coming. It's one of the first ones. Coming back uh, uh, this time of year, we get to see them fishing. And it's just some more shots of a, a seagull and some eagles. And it's a sora, yeah. This is a bird called a sora, and it likes cattails and marshes. And um, it's the first time I've seen one. I had to reach out to my nephew, the ornithologist, uh, Maybe you might have known, but I just, uh, it's like, what is this? It's so cool looking. Um, I just saw that this week. So, moving on. Uh, Missouri turkey vultures. We got to bring back one of the cams that Bob started up, I believe it was in 2011, uh, 2012, with uh, Chuck and John uh, down in uh, Missouri, uh, in Marshall, Missouri. And they got a hold of Bob and said, we got turkey vultures in our barn. How'd you like to put a cam down here? We had a couple years where it worked out great. Then there was a family with uh, uh, some dogs and kids, and it just didn't work out. And uh, things changed. And it was back to, hey, we had a successful year last year. Let's get that cam going again. So this has been a really cool year to see the turkey vultures. I believe it's the only turkey vulture cam out there in the world right now. Um, and this might be the only one pretty much ever. But uh, we've got one of the adults sunning there, which is one of the coolest things to watch turkey vultures do. They spread their wings, and they got that bluish, purplish cast to their wings. You can't see it here, but you can see the glow of the sun on the back in the shadow. Here's the two young now. The watchers call them little bits. They're not so little anymore. Um, they're going to be losing their down, and now you can see they're stretching out those wings, and they're, they're getting ready to to fledge here sometime in the next couple weeks. Very good and monitoring. We had a banner year. This was an awesome year. Um, very rewarding in many ways. One, we didn't have to wear masks all the time. <laughs> it was much more enjoyable that way in the heat. Um, we banded 80 falcons, and there's probably about another eight or 10 that were too old for us to even try on cliff sites. Um, if they're old enough that they look like we could possibly push them off, um, we won't take a chance. And I know Harper's Ferry or Leo's Bluff was one. Uh, I think uh, Mawson's Bluff south of Nelson, Twin Bluffs, Wisconsin was one. So there's a number of them that we couldn't get to. So we could have been close to pushing 90, and that would have been, I think, a record. Uh, so we're finding some more nest sites, uh, natural ones, and um, our, our monitoring and banding program is strong as it's ever been. Here, uh, um, this... Uh, 
I guess Effigy Mounds last year was just an amazing moment where, where Bob and uh, John Dingley and Dave Kester and the group that raised the Peregrine Falcons and left him here and then released them over a two-year period at Effigy Mounds off of Hanging Rock. Uh, that monumental uh, event where they basically helped the falcon figure out and remember where it came from. Most of them were going towards square shop, square shaped nest boxes on bluffs or other buildings, and they were not going back to the natural iries and potholes, and they figured it was nest site imprinting, and they were correct, and two years after they did that release, they started showing up Lansing, uh, uh, Queens Bluff, and, and uh, uh, Maiden Rock. The Mawson's, I believe, were some of the first ones. Maybe Castle Rock was, too. So just some amazing research that was done, and and that work that Bob and the Raptor Resource Project did, that's what made this banding for the last two years so special. So 29 site visit. This is a shot from last year. This is that uh, we were banding uh, Bob and, and Maggie, um, named after Bob and Maggie Jones. Um, and it was just monumental. It was, it was one of those experiences that you never forget. And here's some of our uh, falcons at Redbird Bluff. So let's talk a little bit about D37, D35, D36. You guys heard out. Anyone who came to the telemetry uh, demonstration today got to learn that, if you didn't know already, that D35 was found dead and that she died because of lead poisoning. You know that the females are more susceptible to lead poisoning than the male eagles are. So I guess, unfortunately, that that makes sense. There's number six shot, probably, you know, some BB shot from small game or, or bird hunting. D27 is currently right around here, you know, upper Iowa River, just a little bit west of town. Sometimes she's been hanging just a little bit south of town here. Uh, so she's still around. She's probably got a white head now. She's probably just about getting ready to find a mate and maybe that on territory one of these days. D36, we know that he's been hanging out uh, up towards Camp, uh, uh, Harmony, Preston, and Chatfield, Chatfield area. High water, we know it's the root river. So here's D35 and D36, uh, right here at the hatchery, the year that they were dispersing. They look like they're all ready to go, standing straight up, and just for the camera. I think they were hams. Here's that shot uh, showing where D27 has been hanging out. Cora, Upper Iowa River, Trout Creek. Here's that shot that Amy put together, which is really cool. It kind of shows how much an eagle can really see when they're up in the, in, in the sky. So they, it's totally different, the perspective that they see when they're in the air. So how do they navigate and find these rivers and valleys and, and, and find prey and find other eagles? It's easy. They've got the eyesight to do it, and they've got the height to do it. So here is just a simulation of Chatfield, and here's the Cora. And you can easily see how they could follow that riverine system and make their way back down to the core. Classroom. Uh, the pandemic hit. We had just put out our virtual education program. Um, our teacher group, a bunch of them are here. We got some of our teacher education group folks here right now. Right? Yep. Lori and Meg is here, I think. Right? And Deb. Any others? Um, but anyway, thanks for what you do. Uh, we got some cool content that people are using in the classroom. And one of our, one of the things that we are working on right now with with Jeff Worrell, our new uh, employee, uh, is to get this material out to the classrooms and really help teachers and and others realize and know that this material is there for them. So we might be having a conference to uh, bring some of those teachers in and teach them and show them how to use that. But that's that's in the works right now. You can see we've got the, we've got the educational chat. 
Um, back uh, last time we counted, uh, we had about 1,500 classrooms that have logged in and asked for access to the resources. So we know that folks are seeing this without us really trying too hard. So if we start getting the word out that this stuff is for, out there for you guys, we really think that this could really take off more than it has already. Guest moderators, these kids come in, they know so much about eagles, they probably know more than some, in some areas than, than I could answer. Um, this is our core mission, is really connecting kids and, and people with nature through bald eagles, through peregrine falcons, through the flyway, through uh, you know, restoration efforts and conservation efforts. Just some examples of some of the stuff that they produce. Math, weight, other core and STEM subjects that they work on. Here's some shots of uh, that in action. And here's some mantle, uh, Lori, uh, some of the verb, verb uh, demonstrations of showing their verbs. Mantle and soar. I've been in the classroom when they do this stuff and it's just precious. <laughs> It's precious to see kids learning this way and doing this stuff, and then talking to the families about it afterwards. It really is a kind of learning that um, is more efficient and effective a lot of times than reading stuff out of a book. OK, our banding station, not going to talk a whole lot about that, but we did have two banding stations. Um, we saw lots of species. We have uh, stipends that we do with Luther College. Um, and we were hand in hand with them. We're on Luther property up on Hawk Hill. And we set up two blinds, one on Hawk Hill and one over at the Reddick Farm this last year. And we, we, the students got lots of experience. We masked up, we had filtration units and things to protect through COVID, pro COVID protocol. We made it through that successfully. So um, it was a very successful year. Uh, Dave Kester will probably be here later if you want to talk to him about any of that program. It's a, it's an amazing program. It was funded for two years by an IDNR REIT grant, and we've, we loved it. We've been running it every year based on contributions from all, you all and others that, uh, that help support us. It's such an important program. Just some examples. Here's Sophia Landis, who also claims and, and bans falcons with us and does monitoring. as a perfect example of bringing new uh, researchers and new people up through the ranks. Sophia started out in the banding station, and um, now she's helping us out on, on, on multiple fronts. So bringing in, training in the new guard, right? Here's an example of Dave Kester and Emily Neal here right in the Decorah schools, training and teaching some of the kids. They got a curriculum that they get pre-approved in advance by the school district and they come into different grades and do a program and those birds that they're catching up on Hawk Hill, they'll let the teachers know and then they'll come down and do the release and do a, a program outside with the kids. We have the Robert Anderson Memorial Scholar Scholarship Rams program and that's going strong. It's self-funding now. Thank you so much for all your donations. Anyone can still make donations to that. Right now we're funding a $1,500 scholarship annually to a student at, at Luther College right now that's in an environmental science or biology coursework program. And you know we've done that, this is our third year now that we've offered that. And the, the funding is, is uh, just the returns on the money through the Community Foundation of Northeast Iowa. They're the ones who manage that fund for us. It's self-sustaining now. And someday we'll add to it, maybe we can sponsor two students. Philippine Eagle, we're making progress there. We might be working on a monumental program to help them draw in some funding resources and some, some uh, uh, famous people, some entertainers and others to help with the Philippine Eagle effort to help this most endangered eagle in the world and help uh, educate the Philippine folks just like Cornell and like Neil Reddick and Laura Johnson and others have already been doing. It's a successful program with Bird of Prey and some of the other programs that have been shown over there. Um, they'd like, we'd like to try to help them with that breeding program and take that to the next level. Just a shot of that, and you can go to Amazon and you can rent uh, Bird of Prey for 15 bucks anytime you want and watch that amazing movie. 
what's coming for 2022. Nest cam prep maintenance, September, November. We look forward to that every year. We get to invite our good friend T.K. Arnold back in from San Francisco and help us out. We got new eco location in Decora. You know, we need to have that backup cam, and we can't trust uh, that they're going to nest an N2B. So we probably will be finding another eagle nest here close by. We've got some good prospects and camming up another nest here uh, this fall, just so we do have a backup nest, just in case something happened at the Coronor, which was our main eagle cam for our education program this year. We brought back the Eagle Valley Flyaway Cam. So this coming fall with the migration should be pretty amazing to see that. We got the Flyaway Cam in Lake Alaska. We'll see some differences between those two, uh, but we're really excited to see another one that we can watch what's going on on the mighty Mississippi. And then we got the Golden Eagle Monitoring Program that we've approved. We saw Jeff Laurel earlier today talking about Golden Eagles and how they come down to this part and they winter down here. Um, we're really excited to uh, get going with that program. So that's, that's a pretty exciting thing. Just some of the noteworthy Raptor films. You guys know these. You know, the ones that Bob and Neil did. Then we got Iowa Public Television talks about Bob and the transition, you know, when, after Bob passed away. Decoding the Driftless, Secret Life of Owls, Bird of Prey, and then recently Eagle Power with PBS Nova. I can put that back up if you want to get. And this is this is being recorded online too. So thank you so much. We're coming up to the end here. Thanks to all of our moderators. Let's just give everybody a hand here. We got our <laughs> moderators, our teachers that are here, and some of our cam operators are here and some can't be here. Cam operators in Florida, Ohio, you know wherever in the country they do it all electronically. Or they do it here from the shed. Or from my basement. <laughs> um, the agencies, all of our partners, we could not do that without them. And you know, we're always doing the best that we can to do a good show as a good example. So uh, anytime there's an opportunity to do this kind of stuff that landowners will be welcoming to do this kind of education and outreach. Our videographers, they make it very easy for Amy and I, especially Amy with her nest flicks and everything, the roundups that she does. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. There's a lot of work and a lot of effort that goes into getting that stuff out there, and it's a pretty lean crew uh, that uh, we've got here, so all that, that effort is, is pretty amazing. I think, you know, John works his butt off. Uh, Susan's been really supportive of it. This is not an easy job, and he's done a really good job. Bob made an excellent choice. He took us from where we were, and that was a good place, but he took us to someplace even better. So yeah. it's here for John. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, everyone. It really is fun most all the time. Sometimes when you get in the business part, it's like, hey, I need an MBA to do this stuff. <laughs> I can, but I'd rather be doing other things. Um, we mentioned teachers already. Um, and probably, you know, a very significant effort, you know, of the full funding and what we do comes through Annenberg Foundation, Charlie Annenberg and the Explore Group. I just want to special thanks, uh, say spe special thanks to them for helping us out with our CAM operator, uh, just uh, assistance and volunteers and, and the funding that they give us each year it really means a lot and it helps us uh, to do what we want to do and go further. So that's all I've got. we got a little bit of time for questions. Uh, our eaglets, as always, uh, um, I think can I come up for just a moment? Yeah. Amy would like to mention our thank you. So I already thank John. I just want to take a moment to thank our moderators. 
The Decor Eagles, I know that was a tough year because we didn't really have that. The Decor North Moderators did an amazing job. The Flyway, you guys are awesome. So I really want to thank you because you do so much engagement, so much for us. So thank you. And Facebook group, I didn't mention you, but you guys are always out there doing the hard work, letting people know what's going on, answering questions. So I don't think any of you are here, but also just so you know, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I was mentioning uh, Annenberg and Explore.org. Uh, um, as far as other organizations that we work closely with, um, we partner with CAMS, uh, especially Balkan Monitoring, that Bob set up relationships for a long time ago with a lot of milling companies up and down the river, um, like in La France area, uh, U.S. Bank, and other, others like that. We've got a bank down in Peoria, Illinois, uh, uh, that we, we banned Falcons at the top of that, we've got an S-Box. Um, we've got a great relationship, and early on I mentioned Maze Internest with uh, Excel Energy. Um, we work with them hand-in-hand -hand with their, their bird cam program, and uh, they're a significant uh, help to us in keeping Amy and I busy. Uh, they keep us busy, and uh, um, we love working with them, and I think you know, that, that special camera out there, probably that first Eagle cam out at Fort St. Brain, it's been challenging over the years, but the last two years we've had some great exposure there with Excel Energy out at that location, and that's that's a special one, and a bunch of the Falcon sites here too, uh, up and down the Mississippi River, so thank you to Excel Energy for partnering with us. Any questions that folks have? Go ahead. I know you banned the falcons, and I know there's a blue one on one leg and a silver one on the other leg. How come they have two? So the question was, I noticed that there's two different bands on the falcons. One of them is through uh, um, the uh, bird banding lab, and that's the actual U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band. Uh, that's the official band, the ID of that bird. That we we got a male and a female band uh, for that silver band. And then we've also got a color band that we use for identification. It's meant to be easily ideable as best as we can with a small band that size. Um, and it's got a number and a letter on it and colors. So that, that one's to help us with spotting scopes or cameras or whatever to ID the bird. You're welcome. That's something that I've definitely thought about. Uh, we've got a couple locations here where there are nests that used to be in some nice big trees, or there's some trees that look like they would be great nests next to a, another nest area. Um, we know the build it and they will come works here. Um, uh, it's a possibility. I was actually thinking about the possibility when we do our work here of remember mom starting, or actually that young male starting a nest uh, with mom kind of just watching on two summers ago. Um, I think it might be worth starting just a, a partial nest in N1 as a, you know, I've been thinking about that. Um, it's a good idea. Um, the cameras are there already. It would be a, a minimal effort if we're going up there to clean to put a few branches up there and get something started. So we, we probably will talk about it and we might do that. Um, but yeah, a great idea. I thought about that um, at a couple of the other potential nest locations that we're looking at. With N2B here already, and with N1, uh, we're thinking, you know, we, I don't know that we're going to try to do something else here. We're, we're really hoping that just some of the disturbances over the last couple of years here, you know, may have uh, uh, been some of the reasons that they may have chosen another location, and hopefully. You know, as things have settled down around here, man-made influences and stuff like that, you know, at this next location, they might come back to NTD. We had some construction going on last year. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's things that happen. There's traffic that goes by here with trucks that are hauling gravel and things like that. Just, you know, in the city of Decorah area, things that we, we really don't have any control over. And we notice it, we see some of the Eagles reactions, 
you know, it's like, hey, I wonder, you know, is that affecting my prices? We really have no way to know. But uh, so there's things like that. Uh, maybe we're not putting out enough fish for them. I don't know. You know, I'm gonna, you know, have to talk to Brian and see if we can uh, put it, put more fish out, right? Anything we can do. If you guys got any great ideas, feel free to let us know, and we're always going to consider. Okay. Right, right. Murphy's Law, yeah. And just so you guys know, I mean, here's... Here's kind of how it started. Here's a $750 PTZ analog camera, and here's a $20 homemade... Uh, it was either a bubble juice container or a piece of plastic um, with foam in it. And, you know, Bob was good at doing a lot with, with uh, not a whole lot of cost resources. He was very thrifty. These things worked great in their day. Um, when we put cameras, a couple, multiple cameras up in a nest these days, um, not even talking about hiring climbers and us the work that we do and staying in hotels and things like that, uh, putting three cameras up in a nest easily is about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars these days to bring the the high D HD resolution cameras to you guys. So um, our budget is over three hundred thousand dollars a year. So just the free will donations that folks like you have been making, and I work with, on contract with Excel Energy, and grant from Explore, Annenberg, um, those are the things that keep us going, and bequests too. I have to say that over the last three, four years, we've received some significant bequests, you know, between fifty to $100,000 a piece, coming from folks who decided to include the Raptor Resource Project in their will, in their end of life planning and giving. So. Um, that's huge for us. You know, it's always an option. We're probably going to be letting people know more and more that it makes a difference, and we love it when people can do that. If they want to do that, um, that helps us. So, anyway, here's some some unique uh, mementos. These we got more like this, but these are the ones that came from the Missouri Turkey Vulture site when I got to redo that one um, this year in April, I think. So. Question. Other question, Pauline? Yeah, I have a question about the spray at, at uh, DNN. I noticed this year, it seems more than ever, the more frequently, they would, the adults would bring in tiny bits of food. That's the one that is time. You know, like six trips in with just a morsel. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's interesting. I, and I noticed when taking a look at the statistics, it was actually mentioned parts of birds, animals, or whatever. Now, we know that they will bring in like a turkey foot, a turkey wing, or breast, or parts of animals like that. So, I don't, is that what you're talking about? Or more smaller pieces? Or even smaller, like the Yeah, yeah. So, maybe they're gorging themselves first, and then bringing some of the, the remainders back just to make sure that they're taking care of themselves first. Um, that's, I, I don't know that I've heard of much of eagle caching like falcons do. So I can't say that I know that that's something, but my first first uh, guess is that maybe they're taking care of themselves first before bringing it to the nest. Was it earlier in the year or later in the year? That makes sense because you see what those young will do going after them. Anytime they see a parent with food, it's like they are on one. And they can actually get pretty, they're very aggressive. So that might be because they're taking care of themselves and, and doing that before exposing themselves to 